certainly don't try to suck out venom because that's never really been shown to improve the outcome of any snake bite. I'm Dr. Cyrus Rangan. I'm a medical toxicologist with the California Poison Control System, where I've been assistant medical director for the past 20 years. Today, we'll be looking at toxicology scenes in movies and judging how real they are. Who are you? Hail Hydra. What it looks like is that he has a false tooth uh, that actually contains uh, cyanide. The concept of actually hiding cyanide in a false tooth uh, seems to be a little bit more folklore than it is fact. And in fact, uh, when you when you talk to people at the at the National Spy Museum, they'll tell you that this is not something that people really engaged in. But did uh, villains uh, maybe back in, in in you know the time of Nazi Germany, things like that, did they use cyanide capsules to commit suicide so that they would not be incriminated later? Yes, that that practice actually did occur, there still are some problems with this. <laughs> the concept of the foaming uh, followed very quickly by death is probably more theatrical than it is uh, expected uh, symptoms that you would see from a scientific standpoint. Is it possible that someone might have some excessive drooling or foaming while they're experiencing other symptoms of cyanide poisoning? Sure, that's possible. Uh, but for that to be the only symptom and then so quickly followed by death, that's what gets a little bit far-fetched here. Cyanide, although it is a relatively fast-acting poison, meaning it doesn't take hours to kill you, it still does take a few minutes at least. And perhaps in that five to 10 minute period, that's when death generally is seen. I could give this somewhere between maybe a three or a four. Kyburn, he's the cleverest man I know. Clever enough to learn what poison you used to murder Marcella. The long goodbye was at it. The long farewell. That's the one. Obviously, we are not aware as toxicologists of any poison that is even nicknamed the long farewell. Uh, so it sounds like it's entirely made up. How long does the poison take? Difficult to say, hours, days. It depends on the subject's constitution. But death is certain. Oh yes, quite certain. If we are to go with his uh, assessment that this could take several hours or perhaps days to kill you, there are some toxins out in the world that could act like that. And, and the one that comes to mind is uh, the disease botulism. And botulism is a disease that does work relatively slowly from that standpoint. <laughs> the concept of putting it on somebody's lips and kissing that person and then being able to neutralize that with some kind of, kind of an oral antidote is a little bit far-fetched. When it comes to poisons and antidotes or antitoxins, uh, it really depends on the poison itself in terms of uh, whether there is an antitoxin or antidote available. It's not common that we would have a very deadly poison that you could take immediately and then give an antidote immediately orally that is suddenly going to neutralize that poison and limit its ability to kill you if it's something that would kill you otherwise. For this one, I would probably put it in the range of about two to three. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is called Iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the more deadly poisons known to man. For Wesley to say that it uh, dissolves instantly in any liquid is also a little bit far-fetched because, for example, things that dissolve well in water don't dissolve well in alcohol and vice versa. So to say that it dissolves in any liquid uh, is something that probably goes beyond the realm of science. <laughs> We're talking about a poison here that kills someone very, very quickly. And there aren't really many poisons that can do that, that can kill you within seconds where you look just fine and then suddenly die. I spent the last few years building up an immunity to Iocane powder. In general, when we're talking about poisons, these aren't things that you can really build up an immunity towards. You can build up immunity towards infectious diseases, but building up an immunity towards a poison is not something that we uh, generally see. There is a concept that's called tolerance. So for example, with drug users, they tend to require higher and higher doses of whatever drug of choice they use in order to achieve their desired effect. And that's a different kind of concept, but the concept of immunity from a poison is not something that we would uh, consider scientific. I would probably give it a three. Peter? That's Nightlock, Peter! You'll be dead in a minute! 
I didn't know. So Night Lock is, is, is fictional as far as the name is concerned and probably is derived from, from Nightshade and perhaps they are combining it with Hemlock, which is another poison. But when you look at those particular berries, those look like what are called Atropa Belladonna uh, berries, which is uh, commonly referred to as Deadly Nightshade, where you could get dizzy, kind of confused, a little bit loopy and possibly unresponsive. And sometimes uh, patients can be so severe that they get seizures and coma. And if you're going to die from deadly nightshade, that would be the reason. Where it does fall apart a little bit for me is when she says that it will kill you in a minute. <laughs> the bottom line is that you should never, ever, ever do your own foraging unless you are a botanist and someone who's well trained. And I'd put, probably put it about, around a four. When I was a kid, whenever we went hiking, we always carried olive oil and a razor blade in case of a snake bite. The depiction of this particular snake bite wound looked a little bit unusual to me. Uh, usually a snake bite is a subcutaneous injury where the fangs uh, make it down into the, uh, the tissue at or below the skin layer. And then you start to get a lot of destruction of the tissue around that area and a lot of inflammation and subsequent swelling. So you don't expect to see that, that sort of uh, voluminous bag of fluid. Yeah. I'm so brave. What we have learned, however, over the last uh, several decades is that cutting into a snake bite wound is probably a very bad thing to do. And we've seen many cases where people actually introduce more injury into the situation uh, than, than, than help the situation. So people are cutting into arteries and veins, cutting into nerves, cutting into tendons. So these are, are very bad things that can happen as a result of slicing into that wound. So in general, we don't slice into snake bite wounds. Good boy. And we certainly don't try to suck out venom because that's never really been shown to improve the outcome of any snake bite. In medieval times, people uh, back then said that you should coat your lips with olive oil and open the wound and suck out the, the venom. And again, this was back from medieval times, but unfortunately, a lot of those kinds of treatments, especially for envenomations, carried over through the centuries. The general rule of thumb for any snake bite is simply to get to a hospital as soon as humanly possible. Uh, there really is no other first aid that you really need to do other than to keep the patient calm so you can be evaluated and evaluated for the need for anti-venom. And I would actually rate the accuracy at quite low, somewhere between zero and one, and simply because they are talking about treatments that could really make a bad situation worse. Castor beans. So what are we going to do with them? You're going to process them into rice. Ricin, of course, is a real toxin, and we derive from natural sources. It actually comes from the castor bean or, or the castor seed. When you're ingesting ricin, it causes mayhem in your gastrointestinal tract. So what's going to happen is you're going to experience extremely voluminous fluid loss. And it can be so uh, severe that it, it's impossible to catch up by just simply drinking and trying to replace those fluids. And can it cause death? Yes, it can from all those fluid losses. It's toxic in small doses, also fairly easy to overlook during an autopsy. And that's probably true that if someone was experiencing uh, extreme uh, vomiting and uh, diarrhea and, and dehydration and then death, uh, ricin is not necessarily the first thing that people would think of. People would think more about infectious diseases uh, causing those kinds of problems. Kind of under the weather, like you've got the flu. That would be the ricin I gave you. There is no direct antidote uh, for ricin. It's really, the treatment is what we call in medicine supportive care. So in other words, we treat the bad symptoms that occur uh, from the, the actual poisoning itself. You know, she was uh, on the phone and conscious and, and you know, so if she was experiencing symptoms, she probably was in the very early phase. So she probably could get herself to a hospital and maybe get ahead of the poisoning by making sure that she's got IV fluids on board as soon as possible before the severe symptoms took place. Yeah, it's entirely possible that he's uh, giving it away a little bit too early for her uh, so that she could potentially get treatment and survive. As far as the scientific accuracy, I would give this an eight. And follow. It begins, of course, with, uh, with Bond drinking a poison from his glass. What uh, we learn later is that this poison was digitalis. Now, digitalis is a real 
uh, uh, poison. It's a real compound. But digitalis itself is available in a number of different plants. So there's a plant called foxglove, another one called lily of the valley. It's actually a medication and it helps the heart uh, pump more efficiently. And when given under medical supervision, under uh, precise circumstances, and we're checking drug levels, it's a, it's a reasonable thing to do for patients. Uh, however, in, in large doses, uh, digitalis and other related compounds uh, can cause uh, severe poisoning. Some poisons can uh, cause some major symptoms with just a very, very small dose. Uh, digitalis probably would not be one of them. I would not expect digitalis in the form of a couple of drops in a martini glass, uh, and then after that is then you know distributed throughout the rest of the glass, and then a couple of sips later, you're suddenly experiencing digitalis poisoning. That's a little bit far-fetched. And while it is true that if you instill a, a concentrated salt solution into your stomach very rapidly, it will likely make you vomit, making somebody vomit after taking a poison into the stomach is actually not well supported scientifically. So this is not really a practice that we espouse anymore. So that's something where he was probably really wasting his time. Bond's been poisoned. He's going into cardiac arrest. Stay calm. Tricky attack of cardiac digitalis. So now they've identified the toxin in, in record time. Now that is a real term, and that's a term referred to the lower chambers of the heart uncontrollably beating very, very fast. And that is something that does require immediate treatment. One thing that I could say that they represented more or less uh, effectively was the uh, feelings that he was having, the symptoms that he was having. So it sounds like he was having a, you know, a pounding feeling in his chest and some nausea and he's sweating. Those are the kinds of symptoms that you might expect uh, from digitalis poisoning. Take the blue combi pen bond, mid-neck, into the vein. That will counteract the digitalis. They have him inject something into his neck. The term combi pen is something that, that it's, a, it's a simply made up word. I'm just hazarding a guess that lidocaine is what they use because that is something you can uh, inject into people who have ventricular tachycardia from a poisoning. But as I mentioned before, it's gotta be given under very well supervised uh, circumstances. I'll get yourself off to hospital. I will do. As soon as we won this game. If you have any poison on board that's causing an abnormal heart rhythm, um, yeah, you want to restore the heart rhythm back to normal, but that doesn't cure you of the poison. But what he actually needs is the real treatment for digitalis, which is digitalis specific antibodies. And that actually is the first line treatment. It, it is a little bit uh, unbelievable that he's not rushing to a hospital right now to get that, uh, that key treatment that he actually needs probably give this uh, about a three. Don't let fish stay! No, it hurts! It hurts! It hurts! Well, there's really only one thing you can do. What? What is it? You're going to have to pee on it. What I think they really did get right is the fact that jellyfish stings uh, tend to impart immediate pain, and it's quite severe for a lot of people as well, depending on how much of the jellyfish tentacle got, got on you. Where I think it falls apart is when it comes to the treatment. It's long been folklore that you should urinate on a jellyfish sting. There is no scientific backing to it. You simply use the seawater to wash off any remnants of those tentacles that may still be on the site. Those remnants include tiny little cell-like uh, bags called nematocysts. And if they remain on your skin, they can still discharge. And so we like to use salt water essentially to cleanse those off gently. So urine has the potential to be able to accomplish that too. You're better off just using the seawater than peeing on yourself. If you put fresh water onto a jellyfish sting where those nematocysts are still on your skin, they can discharge under conditions of fresh water. So if your urine perhaps is too dilute at that moment, you could actually discharge those nematocysts and cause more pain. In a lot of cases, urinating on yourself probably won't make things uh, too bad for you. It probably won't help, but in certain situations, it could make things worse. Uh, this is not a good illustration about what to do afterwards. I would uh, give this uh, a, a round of six. Dad, I can't feel my hands. The poison is affecting your nervous system. Stay even. An insect sting or insect bite that could result in uh, the depression of the central nervous system 
That's probably not going to happen from, from most things uh, in this sort of immediate uh, fashion that we're seeing here uh, within seconds or within minutes. There is actually a disease called tick paralysis, where there's a certain kind of tick, a hardback tick, that actually has a neurotoxic uh, venom that's injected into very, very tiny amounts into us, but can actually cause full body paralysis. But the tick has to latch onto you and stay there for several hours, perhaps even a day. So there is that real uh, possibility that yes, an insect could give you uh, paralysis. Uh, would it happen this quickly? I don't think so. <laughs> Inject yourself directly into your heart with the first stage. Do it now. We give the liberty that this is a science fiction movie and that there is some uh, fictional super bug uh, out there that is causing this uh, paralysis. Um, but would we um, have a situation where we thought a neurotoxin injected from a bug would need to be treated by an injection into the heart? Uh, that's where things fall apart for me uh, as well. If you had, for example, an allergic reaction to, let's say, a bee sting, you could still also give intravenous epinephrine by putting it into a vein, but if you didn't have that access, you didn't have the ability to set that up and your uh, you know, time's ticking away, you can make the argument that you could give an epinephrine shot directly into the heart. And that actually is the initial treatment we would give for nerve agent exposure. It would be atropine directly into the heart. So yes, there is an argument to be made for intracardiac injections of certain medications in very specific circumstances. Uh, but certainly not for an envenomation. I'd probably put this in the range of about zero to one. I'd say the one that's most scientifically accurate uh, was the one from Breaking Bad. They used the good, uh, correct terminology and uh, gave an illustration of what is supposed to happen to a person under these circumstances. The most fun to watch, I think, was Princess Bride, as I think it is. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, click the link above for another.